Some people have been theorizing that the ATF is trying to trap innocent American gun owners with this new stabilizing brace or pistol brace regulation that runs 293 pages. Well, I may have found a silver bullet that prevents the ATF from even thinking about doing exactly that. That is statute title 26 USC 5848. And by the way, you may find this hard to believe. The ATF seemed to have forgotten to cite the statute that I'm going to bring to your attention in just a second. Stay tuned. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box of Diner, proud American gunner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and New York Times bestselling author. If you haven't subscribed to the Four Box of Diner Second Amendment channel, please do so and show your love for the right to keep and bear arms. So we have been posting over the last several days a series of discussions about this ATF pistol brace regulation. It is a crazy regulation to me it seems unconstitutional and illegal for a whole host of reasons, completely confusing, and one wonders whether or not you could ever be convicted under these regulations for a whole host of reasons we've talked about in prior videos and I'll talk about in the future. Of course, no one can predict the future with certainty, and it all depends on the facts, but I have to say that I think the ATF is on thin legal ice, both as a matter of administrative law as well as constitutional law. And the reason why I say this is I keep hearing that this may be a trap to force people to admit to federal law enforcement that they've been committing a crime because they've been holding on to a short barrel rifle for the last several years, and this was illegal because it wasn't registered, and now by submitting it to the ATF, you're admitting you've been committing federal crimes. Well, I actually don't think this is true. And I want to be clear, though. I do not trust the ATF as a general matter for many reasons. I do not trust, trust federal law enforcement for many reasons. And I've repeatedly said as a general matter, if you ever have to encounter law enforcement in any way where you might be a subject or a target of an investigation or anything at all like that, you really, as a general rule, should not talk to them without first consulting a lawyer and letting, their, let, letting your lawyer talk to law enforcement. That's my general default rule that I have delivered since I began practicing law. And I remain steadfast in that general advice that generally speaking, you don't want to be talking or interacting with law enforcement without the consultation of lawyers. That is generally good advice, and I still stand by that. Moreover, I think it's fair to say that we should be concerned about whether or not the ATF is trustworthy for many other reasons, not least of which is that in the last couple years, the ATF has done a 180 degree turnaround on two major issues of law. We know that they went out and banned bump stocks, claiming that these were machine guns, uh, which I know that the Cargill case in the Fifth Circuit suggests that's clearly wrong. I think that's true. It's wrong. Nevertheless, the ATF went from saying bump stocks were legal and not machine guns to their illegal machine guns in a matter of years. Not good for their credibility. And now we have a situation where in many instances, the ATF has said that pistol braces when attached to a pistol, does not convert them into short barrel rifles requiring registration under the National Firearms Act. And now here we go with a 293-page document signed by Merrick Garland, the Attorney General of the United States, that indeed a pistol with the stabilizing braces may very well convert what you have in your closet into a short barrel rifle that requires registration. So I don't think the ATF has a lot of credibility here and is particularly trustworthy. Now, with that out of the way, I want to give you what I think is generally good news on this front. Okay, there is a federal statute that I want to bring to your attention. And if there's a lot of interest in this, I'll, I'll do a deeper dive later. But I want to bring it to your attention now because a lot of you have lawyers out there and people working on your cases and looking at things. So I just want to bring it to your attention so you and your lawyers are aware of this and can do your own research. I'll try to do a couple more videos on this. But the bottom line is this. The law I want you to take a look at or your lawyer should take a look at, is Title 26, Title 26 of the United States Code, Section 5848. That's 26 U.S.C., U.S. Code, United States Code, 5848. I will put a link to it down below. This federal statute clearly provides that information 
you give to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, never forget the explosives, to the BATFE, for purposes of complying or attempting to comply with the National Firearms Act, cannot be used against you in criminal proceedings, with the exception that you can't lie to them. So as long as you don't lie, you cannot, they cannot use this information to prosecute you for crimes if you give them information for the purposes of complying with the National Firearms Act. So arguably, and probably this is true, if you submit information to the BATF about your alleged purported short barrel rifles to register them, you should be protected by this law. That should be the case. And that appears to be the case, honestly. So let me read the law to you so you can see the language for yourself. I'll talk a little bit then after, after that about where this law came from and why it came into existence, why Congress passed it, and a couple other observations. And then, you know, we'll see what you guys have to say about this in your comments below. And I'll try to look at the comments and maybe respond to some of those uh, in future videos. So the federal law, 26 U.S.C., 5848 is part of a series of laws dealing with tax privacy and other types of privacy, but this deals specifically with the National Firearms Act. So 26 U.S.C. 5848 deals with the National Firearms Act and information that is given to the BATFE for the purposes of NFA compliance. Here's what the statute, this is a congressional statute, a federal law. This is a federal law, mind you. Here's what it says. Two parts, Section A and Section B. Section A, general rule. No information or evidence obtained from an application, registration, or records required to be submitted or retained by a natural person in order to comply with any provision of this chapter or regulations issued thereunder shall accept as provided in subsection B, which is dealing with the, the line on a federal form issue. Okay, that's, if you don't lie, that's a separate issue, okay? Shall accept this provided in subsection B of the section, again, line on the form, shall accept this provided in subsection B of the section be used directly or indirectly as evidence against that person in a criminal proceeding with respect to a violation of law occurring prior to or to or or concurrently with the filing of the application or registration or the compiling of records containing the information of evidence. All right? Let me read the key parts again. The key parts are no information or evidence obtained from an application, registration, or records required to be submitted which if you are being required by the ATF to submit information about your pistol and stabilizing brace, that seems pretty obvious that that is information or evidence that you are submitted to the NFA, you know, submitted pursuant to the F NFA to the ATF for the purposes of an application registration or records required in order to comply with any provision of this chapter or regulations issued. So obviously to comply with the NFA or the regulations, as absurd as these regulations are, if you wanted to comply with them, Arguably, you could or would have to uh, file your forms, your information with the ATF. Okay, so we are talking about those submissions. Okay, none of the information you provide, no information or evidence that you submit as part of this registration process in order to comply with the regulations of the statute, which is what we're talking about here, shall, here's the key, shall, shall, which means mandatory, no information shall be used used, shall be used directly, directly or indirectly as evidence against that person, the person submitting the forms, the information, right? Shall be used as evidence against that person in a criminal proceeding, which is going to jail and being indicted, being charged with a crime to go to jail, as evidence against a person in a criminal proceeding with respect to a violation of law occurring prior to Hear what I just said? With respect to a violation of law occurring prior to 
or concurrently with the filing of the application or registration. So if you think you've been committing a crime, needless to say, I'm skeptical about all that because of things we've talked about before, you know, whether or not the ATF has the authority to redefine these handguns with stabilizing braces as short barrel rifles, not getting into that, assuming for the sake of argument, uh, that the ATF is right, these regulations are valid. We're assuming quite a bit. That's what we're assuming to analyze this particular law, which again is 26 USC 5848. Okay, again, no information or evidence submitted in this part of the application or registration shall be used directly or indirectly as evidence against the person in a criminal proceeding, that's a criminal charge, with respect to the violation of law occurring prior to, meaning the last several years, or concurrently with, concurrently with means now, meaning you have an illegal NFA item now. That's what concurrently with means. So occurring prior to in the past or concurrently with now the filing of the application or registration or the compiling of records containing the information or evidence, okay? So based on 26 USC 5848, and I think this is actually valid and I think the ATF follows this by and large to a T. And I'll tell you why I think that in a second. I've looked at this, I've looked at some evidence. And I think it's true. All right, so now I just want to mention quickly, there's a section B here. I don't think you need to lose too much sleep about section B other than to just know about it because section B specifically has an exception that shouldn't apply to you, but the exception is uh, furnishing false information. So section uh, 26 USC 5848A protects you. It's an immunity statute. It protects you from what you submit being used against you in a crime. B talks about furnishing false information that simply says section A of the section shall not preclude the use of any information or evidence in a prosecution or other action under applicable under an applicable provision of law with respect to the furnishing of false information. So this is talking about if you lie, they can still go after you for lying you don't get a, a, a get out of jail free card for lying, but you do get a get out of jail free card if you're trying to comply with the law and you submit information. That cannot be used against you. Now, I think actually from all evidence that this is indeed complied with and a, a followed by the ATF. Again, I always have a level of distrust when it comes to law enforcement, even though I'm generally pro-law enforcement. As an attorney, having been around the block with lots of clients and uh, seeing a lot of things happen, I'm always very skeptical of government power and law enforcement and in particular the ATF because, again, there's many instances that have given rise over the years that do raise questions about how trustworthy they are. But when it comes to this issue, they seem to be pretty good. A reason why I think the ATF seems pretty good is I did some legal research just to see if I could find any evidence of the ATF trying to get around and circumvent 26 USC 5848. Um, if this was something they did a lot of, I would expect to see hundreds and hundreds of cases of you know the ATF trying to charge people for gun crimes or any state or federal agency trying to charge people for gun crimes and then seeing as a defense to those gun crimes, 28 USC 5848 being cited as a basis to suppress the evidence or whatnot. The truth is I've only found a handful of these cases over the last few decades, which tells me that the ATF is being very scrupulous in protecting the confidentiality of this data. I want to mention, why is this federal statute even in existence? It's in existence because of a series of Supreme Court cases decided in 1968. In particular, though, when it comes to this issue, the National Firearms Act, there was a case decided in 1968 called Haynes versus the United States. Haynes versus the United States. Uh, and this basically said, the Supreme Court said, look, forcing individuals to turn over information to the federal government may indeed and can violate the United States Bill of Rights, specifically the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment in the Bill of Rights, right? The Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution is part of the Bill of Rights, along with the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms. The Fifth Amendment is the one that says no person shall be compelled in a criminal case to be a witness against himself, which means, of course, you've seen that all the time. Defendants get charged. It's like, hey, I'm taking the Fifth. I'm not going to talk about it at all. And the argument was that by forcing individuals to submit these documents to the federal government, you violated their Fifth Amendment rights. You were forcing them to testify against themselves. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's right. That's not allowed. So Congress, in response to the Haynes 
versus United States case in 1968 passed this federal immunity statute, 26 U.S.C. 5848, that said, no, if you're submitting documentation or information to the National Firearms Act or to the ATF as part pursuant to the National Firearms Act, uh, you can't use that against them in any criminal cases. By the way, there is case law out there, which I can get into if, if we feel the need. There's actually case law in, out there that to the extent anybody tries to use this information and it gives rise to other incriminating evidence, that all of that evidence can be suppressed uh, as sort of a fruits of the forbidden tree, which is a Fourth Amendment search and seizure concept. Uh, the way that works is if somebody violates your Fourth Amendment rights and engaging in a search and a seizure, then the evidence they've procured is not allowed to be in the, used in court. And the fruits of the forbidden tree, meaning the fruits of the other evidence they may have uncovered from their illegal search and seizure, can also be suppressed and not used against you in a criminal case. That's uh, the Fourth Amendment basic law. And there is authority that to the extent the federal government or even state governments were to violate 28 U.S.C. 5848 and try to use some of this NFA information to prosecute people for a crime, uh, there is, you know, there's case law out there apparently that seems to suggest that it could not be used against you and it would be suppressed. I also want to just read one more thing uh, that I found. I was doing some further research and I looked at the Firearms Law Desk Book written by, you know, a friend of the show, Stephen Halbrook, who's been on the show several times, um, most recently talking about his recent book, The America's Rifle, uh, The Case for the AR-15. Uh, but I looked at Stephen Halbrook's uh, Firearms Law Desk Book, which I know is sort of the Bible for people that practice gun law, uh, which is not anything I've ever done, really. I've never had FFL clients uh, advising them on FFL issues or anything like that. That's why I was hesitant, really, to do a lot of videos on this pistol brace issue. But obviously, it seems to me uh, that I need to do so. I think it's important for the Second Amendment movement and some of the lawyers out there to, to understand some of the things that I'm saying on these videos. So I am uh, doing these videos because I think it's good for the movement and important because it's such a hot topic right now. So with that said, I took a look at his book and I just want to read one paragraph from it. Uh, this is his uh, book, again, Firearms Law Desk Book, the 2021-2022 edition. I think he has many editions out there over the years. Uh, that's the edition I'm reading from on page 85, volume 2. If you're curious, this is what uh, uh, Stephen Halbrook writes in the Firearms Law Desk Book. Quote, in, and I should mention he is talking specifically about the statute 26 U.S.C. 5848. This is what he writes. Quote, in sum, BATF disclosures of any records filed under the NFA or information gained thereby are unlawful under the Fifth Amendment and under 26 U.S.C.A., which is U.S.C., 5848. Again, in some BATF disclosures of any records filed under the NFA or information gained thereby are unlawful under the Fifth Amendment and 26 U.S.C. 5848, Mr. Halbert, or Professor Halbert continues, such evidence cannot be used to obtain search warrants or for prosecution of the violation of any law, federal or state, other than other than the making of false entries in NFA records, which is what I said in Section B, false statements to the government. Okay? So, again, um, I'm not saying that I entirely trust the ATF where they're not looking to play games or they're not trying to set traps. There's no way for me to like know that sitting here. I don't know what the ATF is thinking. I know they're on thin legal ice. Doesn't mean they ultimately won't win. One never knows exactly what courts will do. But I do want to bring the statute to your attention because a lot of the arguments that this is a trap may not be true. And if you force me to bet, I would guess that this is probably not true. And this statute is probably uh, hugely valuable to those gun owners that decide to move forward and register their alleged or putative or purported um, short barrel rifles, which I'm not sure they are. I think they are handguns with a brace. But that's a whole separate video and a whole separate topic. But nevertheless, it does appear that this, sec this, this statute, 28 U.S.C. 5848, should provide you the immunity you need to alleviate any concern that by doing this, you're admitting to a past or a current federal crime. Uh, again, there may be some other issues. Perhaps maybe you submit this to the ATF and you're not allowed to have that particular 
item in the state where you live and maybe they deny your ability to register it again. Uh, this is my best guess as to what could occur. I just don't know how the ATF is ultimately going to do this and how they will handle this. But I did want to bring this, this, this federal statute, 26 USC 5848, to your attention because I think it's very important for you and your counsels and anybody else you're, uh, you're working with to figure out your personal situation. I think you should look at this quite carefully as you reflect upon uh, your next steps. Okay, hope you learned a little bit something here today. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel, please do so. We'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.